Uh, he's been working with Vitalik on a couple different things, and we were lucky enough to be able to talk to him about our implementation for our consensus protocol. Um, as kind of an homage to him, I should talk about his theories. Uh, he calls it liberal radicalism, and uh, hopefully we can motivate quadratic voting. Uh, I will then explain why ExoChain integrated quadratic voting into our consensus protocol. And we can talk a little bit about the technical uh, implementation details uh, that you could get caught up on. Uh, for anyone that's on the distributed, or what, what did you call it, decentralized voting? Yeah, decentralized voting. Uh, please contact me. We're definitely looking to help out people that are doing projects in this vein. We have not open sourced our quadratic voting contract, uh, but are happy to collaborate with people that are actually putting boots on the ground and, uh, and doing something. So nice gauge of hands. How many people are developers in the room? Okay, <laughs> I like the, the hand waves. Uh, so uh, what else do we have? Is there uh, any poli sign majors? Matt? Okay, cool. Uh, what else am I missing? Uh, bio, chem? Not fundamentals. All right, cool. Um, I guess we'll start. Uh, liberal radicalism, uh, a TLDR. Uh, this is going to uh, take a step back from the actual implementation. Hopefully we'll wind our way back. If you guys want to stop me to ask questions at any point in time, please do. Um, if this flies over some of your heads a little bit, that's okay. Uh, hopefully I'll get the point across by the time we get to the implementation details. Um, so originally this uh, ideology was, again, all developed independent of blockchain technology. Uh, and in and of itself is its own way of decentralizing power. The problem that Glenn Weil saw, Glenn Weil saw was growing inequality plus stagnation. Uh, not that good. Um, how many of you have read the book Radical Markets? Okay. So this is a book where, uh, no while, <laughs> this is really bad guys, you need really to get the book. Uh, this is pretty much the textbook for quadratic voting, as much as it exists out there, as well as other uh, economic techniques uh, that Glenn Wild has developed. So um, he kind of, um, a lot of the historical context for which uh, theories were developed. If you look at the two graphs here, uh, I'm the, the left is the share of 1%, obviously rising over time. And if we look at the share of income paid to workers on the right, uh, it's been kind of dropping. Those troughs are obviously the, the recent recession. Uh, uh, problem, uh, it stems off of Reaganomics in the sense that um, a whole trickle down economy did not work. And instead of uh, seeing increase levels of um, uh, competition and driving more um, diverse ideas and market share in the economy, we see the opposite. Uh, so the share of income occurring to workers has fallen and the concentration of wealth is right thinking. And we get less competition and more effective taxes imposed by corporations. And this is an important point uh, to note we really don't think about it in this regard, but companies kind of levy taxes already um, that you kind of have to absorb into your, your uh, day spent into the economy. Uh, a good example for this is the East India Company. If uh, any of you are uh, history buffs, it doesn't look like any one of them might be this. But the, entirety, the entire original uh, problem behind this was that there was a lot of collusion between the British government and the East India Company. Um, in the form of tariffs placed on tea. Uh, this obviously hasn't been, uh, I'm mentioning it, uh, because of the Boston Tea Party. And it was maybe the first sign that there's a problem and it's kind of been getting worse um, as we go along. Um, to make this a little bit interactive, um, there's reasons why this kind of affects one person, one vote as a voting model. Um, and it's less effective now than it's been in the past. Um, can anyone give an example? No? Uh, Bitcoin mining? Okay, 
okay. The crew mining is a good one, and we'll get to that uh, in a minute. But even within the current political democratic context, uh, we see the idea of super PACs that have emerged. Uh, we see people that uh, actively use techniques like machine learning and mass marketing to affect elections. Uh, we're investigating the whole Russia debacle right now. And all that money already takes uh, effect on the current democratic process. Ignoring it is um, naive. Uh, can we make a better model in order to solve this? And this is where um, Glenn Whale's vision comes in. Now, he calls it Marketopia. Um, I will kind of outline it briefly, and then uh, I hope to draw the analogies between uh, this model in, in the quote unquote real world and the current socioeconomic context that uh, we we're always talking about it in, and then the direct analogies uh, that kind of inspired the action chain consensus uh, mechanism to use quadratic voting. Um, so Marketopia is Wales' journey of imagination through a fictive city uh, by that name. Uh, this goes into a lot of the proposal that he talks about in Radical Market, we'll only cover a few. Uh, so Marketopia, this is Wales' idea of a journey in the imagination to a city by this name. Um, the idea here is very simple and I'm glossing over a lot of the details. Um, please read the book. Uh, but the idea is uh, all major private property, uh, land houses, intellectual property, planes, cars, uh, anything else is continuously up for auction to the highest bidder. And you can keep your assets if you satisfy the following two conditions. One, you must make a monthly payment uh, of get that highest bid to a common pool of resources. And we'll get to that in a second. And you must be ready and willing to give up the asset to anyone that outbids you. Uh, this means, in effect, that all property has this idea of common ownership. And when you take part of uh, the pool of common ownership, you kind of have to um, repay what you're taking away from society. Uh, the second caveat is that all major collective decisions, including governance, uh, where you put national parks, what the tax rate should be, um, uh, rather than being decided by the highest single bidder, um, there are many choices and options that you have uh, to make. Everyone submits a bid on each of these options, and whoever has whichever option for any particular choice has the highest submitted bid is selected. And this is uh, where quadratic voting falls out of. Um, the other big portion uh, behind this proposal is that in Marketopia, all revenue raised in these kinds of auctions are returned to every citizen in equal shares. And this effectively creates a social dividend and redistributes wealth. Um, we'll talk about why that's efficient uh, in a few slides, but I want to pause here and see if anyone has any questions. Cool. So where did this all originate? Um, has anyone, has anyone here heard of uh, William Vickery? Clark? Okay, uh, do you want to tell the group what you know? Well, I just know about the Vickery auction. So the idea is it's like a normal auction where you don't know the other bids, except the guy who pays is the winning bidder, but he pays the second highest amount. So I guess it's like guaranteed that people will always tell the true bids, or they will give like their actual valuation. That's a pretty good summary, actually. And yeah, this pretty much describes uh, what a victory auction is. And generally, William Henry Victory was, uh, you could say, the father of mechanism design. And there's the ideas of getting you to play in a mix that have um, measurable results in terms of efficiency. And he is kind of the father for that and won the Nobel Prize for it in 1996. The uh, mechanisms that uh, we're going to talk about are exactly that, and I want you to look at them as black markets. Um, they solve problems, not just like the ones you guys may be thinking about uh, in making elections or making simple decisions, but really when you think about them as mechanisms, uh, you can use those tools in your toolbox to uh, solve problems in a way that decentralizes work. And this is a uh, very key. Um, so all this falls under the umbrella of political radicalism. Uh, 
Um, and I, again, I feel that it's a, a complete uh, John Wells original ideology behind this. And uh, it is somewhat political. And uh, some of our, the, the, my design decisions uh, are hard to justify without uh, context. Um, so whereas liberalism is the supremacy of the individual and in whole case, uh, the center of liberalism is the opposition to historically derived hierarchical authority in favor in favor of fluid dynamic and evolving possibilities. Um, he has a view that individuals make up or not really familiar their history or even their history. Uh, but what I would like to call, call them something that they call the mimetic code. Um, the medic code is uh, the idea that you often set the overla overlapping communities uh, in which you participate. And what makes it interesting is that the intersection of these communities that we participate in are moving to a certain way. Um, and similarly, uh, communities are made up of the individuals that constitute them. And the two really are small um, This kind of goes uh, for the deeper uh, ideology of uh, if you, if the individual is the diplomatic code, then the way to optimize uh, the entire situation isn't by being greedy necessarily, um, but by uh, enhancing the entire fabric uh, that is our society. Uh, and the question comes up, you know, why are more of it a solution? What people do they serve? And really, the way to look at it is that um, markets are intended and described by liberal radicalism. Uh, so the notion that fluid, constantly evolving systems uh, that are, di are diverse and at the same time equal uh, are exactly what markets represent. Um, if you're trading stocks, uh, it doesn't matter what you understand, your race, what your background is, it doesn't matter if you put in the call or the buy at the right time. Um, the fundamental principle here is that um, while we have different abilities and uh, specializations, we each can equal contribution to society, and markets are tools to achieve this. Um, so, I'll now get into the motivation for X and Chain uh, and what I like to call practical radicalism. Uh, a lot of these ideas, when you talk about in an economic context, are very detached and um, not something that can be implemented practically. Uh, I doubt that, as much as I would love to see uh, a democratic government go into something like voting in order to find a representative, uh, I probably don't have to convince you that you're very far away from uh, such a reality. And uh, the idea of a universal social dividend is also probably not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, and part of this plays on the idea that there would be in socialism and the democracy and that really kind of wants to uh, slap that in face and show that there's a better way. Uh, someone brought up Bitcoin, uh, and this is a very good example as to uh, a similar problem that we've been having in um, the blockchain decentralization movement. Um, this is, took us a couple minutes ago. Uh, so this is the current hash rate distribution for Bitcoin. I'm going to assume everybody understands how Bitcoin works and uh, what hash power means. Um, effectively, what you have to worry about if you if you don't is um, if you have a majority of the people that are mining uh, controlling every block, um, you have a system that because the guarantees for immutability break down once fifty one percent attacks are possible. So if we look at the hash rate distribution for Bitcoin, uh, fifty one percent of uh, distribution made up by four mining firms, uh, at least as far as we know, or they're, they're willing to go. It's a good thing that several of these pools are actually you know, working together. And for Ethereum, it's not much better. It's a little, uh, yeah, it's uh, three uh, different pools uh, making distribution. 
And uh, can anyone tell me how this is disconcerting? Oh, what? Okay, yeah, so there's definitely problems between collusion, really. Um, that is maybe overplayed a little bit, I think, in uh, North media. There's, these are still pulled and managed by a lot of different people. And uh, so, if, if keep in mind, it's not a um, single individual, it's a bunch of different people that are all pulling together. Uh, can anyone else think of a different reason? All of the people underneath the pool are allowing the head of the pool to make a decision for any uh, changes in governance, like decisions on park boards. Okay, you're getting to the right uh, point of the topic that I want to address. And um, if anyone, okay, has, has everyone here sent, or who, who here owns Bitcoin or Ethereum or some form of cryptocurrency? Okay. Cool. Everyone, that's great. Um, so if you've ever through the transaction of the Bitcoin or Ethereum network, uh, you will know, obviously, that you have to pay a gas price or a transaction fee, depending on the network that you're on, in order to have that transaction actually go through. And what this means effectively for the Ethereum network or the Bitcoin network is that 50% of the time, uh, about three or four different groups decide what the price of the transaction is going to be. So half the time that a transaction gets mined, whatever you guys say the transaction should be priced at is what you have to pay. And if not, you have to kind of There's three or four people that essentially decide what the price of transactions are. 50% um, um, of the time, three or more people, about three people, uh, group, groups decide what the transaction fee for a transaction that you're going to send costs. It means that you either have two choices. You can either choose to pay the transaction fee uh, or the limit that they're setting to accept transactions. You could not send the transaction um, at all. And uh, this is a problem. Uh, there's there's no way to, to kind of move these people out of the way, and it kind of functions like a security racket. I have a question. Question. Wait. There, there might be another. Ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> this is a security racket, where you can either choose to send it, and the miners tell you what price you need to pay for it to get accepted. In this case, again, it's two or three different people half of the time that tell you how much you have to pay. So, so and if you don't want to pay it, then uh, your transaction doesn't go through. So wait, And so this is effectively a security racket. Sorry, well, we had a question. Yeah, go for it. So yeah, so my experience with sending Bitcoin transactions has been that I, I choose the price that I want to pay and then like they'll either include my transaction in the block or not and like I'll look at reasonable transaction prices for the past however many blocks and, and choose that price accordingly. Is that not like, could, yep. is it not market driven, right? If, if one mining pool decides, you know, I'm only going to mine transactions that pay 100 satoshis per byte or, you know, some astronomical amount of gas, like another mining pool is going to be like, well, I can, you know, get all those profits by, by doing transactions that don't have lower uh, sure, so you can find it and you said it exactly right. Literally people send transactions out with the average transaction fee that was accepted uh, in the last hour or so. And you do that because that's what it is, but whether it's market driven or not, uh, if you think these guys are competing against each other, you, you haven't paid attention to transaction fee over time. Any other question? So what should we be looking at to uh, see the collusion in transaction fees, which you see? 
Um, you could look at exactly the average transaction fee over time uh, that's been accepted in each block and whether or not that actually, um, how, how far above the profit line are the miners choosing to set those transaction fees. And obviously, they, they need to make money off of the, the electricity that they're spending, and that's how they use the fees. However, you have no control whatsoever with that margin. And it makes it so that in order to save bytes of data on the blockchain, you have to pay close, like, dollars worth of money uh, sometimes. So if you want to get to actual non speculative use cases, uh, where the blockchain is being used regularly and the transaction prices are fleeting wildly uh, because of these miners and there's, there's nothing that you can do about it. Problem for actual adoption. So isn't, couldn't, isn't there one thing you could do about it? Like if you have, right, you mentioned at the beginning that these mining pools are actually made up of like hundreds of miners, right? Couldn't the like random miners that like, couldn't they point their miner at a different pool if they don't like the way the pool is operating? They could. That's effectively not what happens. And we end up with the equilibrium we see now, where there is really three or four different pools that control of it. And if you've ever been part of a pool, essentially the way that it works is the pool sets the transaction fee price that they're going to be they're going to be accepting. So the leader uh, will pick what it is the fee that's going to be done by the people that are contributing hash power. And when you're contributing to a pool, you're essentially just um, trying to solve the hash problem for the current block and sending it to the leader. The leader is the redistribute the money uh, to the people involved, and this kind of amortizes the electricity that you spend in order to uh, make the same amount of money. So doesn't that make yeah. the pool fair then? If, if uh, miners will move if the pool is being run unfairly, doesn't that make the pools market driven? And doesn't it reach equilibrium by accepting like an average price rather than running a racket? Sure. Uh, you would think that it would, uh, but for the Bitcoin network, there's been... Sorry, what was that? No. What are you saying about Bitcoin network? Yeah, so if you've been thinking the Bitcoin network or the Ethereum network, um, the price in order to secure, really what you're talking about security here. So the amount of hash power that is being contributed to each network is the amount of security that you're getting. And for the price that you pay per added bit of security, uh, it just doesn't scale. Like it doesn't, you don't have to think very hard to realize that as more miners are being added and people, the economy switches more to a transaction fee based economy as opposed to a work based economy that people are going to need to keep in transaction fees as the number, the amount of hash power that they get keeps getting diluted by people joining. Well, you're paying for the hash power, but you're also mainly paying for the next megabyte of space in the Bitcoin block. If you want to get a transaction in the next, you just have to put yourself at the top of the mempool and might be rate. And like in practice, Bitcoin miners either mine empty blocks completely or they mine blocks with the highest fee rate transactions. That's been pretty consistent. The, yeah. the bad fee rate thing is usually like really bad fee estimation algorithms or exchanges not giving a shit about paying huge fees and that screws everyone else over. But that's not like the miner is running a crypto. I think it's a completely different problem. Could you add your account? Sorry. I don't know what uh, I'm saying that the problem with huge Most fee rates in Bitcoin has been because of bad fee estimation. And for example, exchanges in the past have. Uh, not cared about paying really high fees, and when they fill up the mempool with high fee rate transactions, then everyone else's fee estimation goes up to the roof too. But in practice, miners will mine high, uh, will mine any transaction to like top megabyte of the mempool. So like right now, you can send uh, transactions that are one satoshi per byte, and all the miners will pick them up if they're mining blocks that are not empty. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, obviously. Um, what, um, what's, what's your, I'm oh, sorry, I'm not sure what the question is. Like, I don't see how that makes it a cartel, or like, kind of, you're kind of implying that they're, they're deciding the price, but it, it looks like Bitcoin miners are picking up even the lowest fee rate transactions. 
they pick up the lowest fee rate transactions when someone mines a block that accept transactions below that fee limit. So when you're mining, you can set the minimum transaction price you're going to accept. And right now that price is set in a centralized way and it's controlled by a few parties. You can still get a low fee transaction to be accepted and you're gonna sit there for God knows how many blocks uh, before your transaction is accepted. So yeah, you're, you're completely right, but I'm telling you from experience talking to corporate clients, the problem that we have for adoption is that we can't offer them constant transaction fees. The cost to send a transaction on the Bitcoin and Ethereum network is obscene. You're paying for an overhead that uh, isn't reasonable uh, for a lot of use cases that Again, corporations need in order to pick this up. And uh, I guess that is a good segue actually into uh, X and Chain. We are not a consumer blockchain. Uh, the idea here is to really make a blockchain for enterprises. Uh, and in order to do this, there are several rules that we kind of have to be able to abide by. Uh, Cryptographic voting kind of um, helps in this regard, uh, where the identities for the people that are running for power uh, need to be well known to all individuals. Uh, banks and corporations want to know that the people processing their transactions aren't terrorists or money launderers, which uh, there's been some studies to suggest there are several mining pools uh, that are contributing to that. Uh, and not just that, but also not have the crazy overhead for these fees. So if you have an inflationary economy where it's reward-based, um, you can still have these transactions and pay relatively low fees because there's a network reward. But if you look at the inflationary model for Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, it explains a lot of the price fluctuation and volatility uh, from an economic standpoint that we see happening right now. So the overhead to run transactions or run a, run any kind of computation on AWS or EC2, we're talking about like four orders of magnitude different in order to run a kind of computation. So I'm talking about what it would be like to make these systems with different security guarantees on different models of distributed systems. So right now, people use EFS for file storage. It's a robust solution that has a security property. Um, if Amazon goes down, um, uh, EFS or S3 go down. Um, it has greater consistency uh, than a blockchain. It's automatically available. Um, there's a lot of uh, use cases right now that you simply cannot do on blockchain because of the crazy overhead for doing this on a public network. And if you try to do it on a permission network, you kind of start to defeat the purpose. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? No, you keep saying crazy overhead. Crazy compared to what? What are you comparing it to? I don't understand this part. 
Okay. Uh, what is the, can you repeat that one? I'm sorry, can I answer any of the questions? Yeah, I, I think, I think it's, we should probably just continue. Because it seems like we just keep going back to the same thing. Yeah, just continue. It's an important point. Like the cost to run an application that is not a DAP is just orders of magnitude cheaper than running a DAP. No one, I can't get a corporation to run transactions on the Ethereum network because they're not willing to pay uh, dollars a day to input information into a database. Spawn, can I, can I ask a quick uh, question? What was that uh, file system you mentioned, EFS? Uh, elastic file system? Oh, that. Oh, okay. The, the Amazon one. Yeah. Okay. Which is which is highly centralized. <laughs> it is the user, so I don't know about centralized, but this is the whole idea where it's still a distributed system and it has different security guarantees. Sure, sure. Who guarantees your security is there? I just want to know who guarantees your security is there. Well, uh, yeah, just uh, yeah, you can continue. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the question? Fine, I don't mind that. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah. No, it's just someone is trying to. So I'm, in, I'm interested to hear about quadratic voting. Yeah. 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 Onward. Democracy squared. Okay. Sure. I'm just going to continue on. Cool. So talking about quadratic voting and it's efficient. Um, this gets a little bit mathy. Uh, feel free to ask questions and stop me any portion of this along the way. Uh, the model is essentially that there are uh, with a cardinal value of 2i, uh, and you have essentially a uh, binary outcome that you can have within an economy. Um, if everyone uh, chooses to be a quadratic voting uh, and pays a v squared in currency, then uh, every follow will then we're able to normalize for expected efficiency. And um, this is pretty easy to derive. Uh, you essentially set the marginal benefit of voting to the marginal cost of voting. Uh, the marginal cost of voting is a derivative of the cost, essentially. So uh, it's pretty simple to call it. It's v squared, ends up being 2v. We set the marginal the kernel value was 2i, uh, so if p is the chance of being pivotal, then we end, uh, where the marginal cost of voting um, is linear with the expectation. Oh, this what? is important because if everybody for p, uh, p is positive or a vote is pivotal, um, we have an implication of efficiency that wouldn't occur for other reasons, for uh, other models. So this is the reason that it's static voting and not cubic voting or um, any anything else. And it kind of makes static voting unique from a heuristic argument where you get frequency in um, the pivotality of the outcome uh, and you get that um, for, for the price that you end up paying. Uh, yeah, we have uh, a, yeah, we have a question. What what, a, uh, yeah. what if the distribution of preferences uh, isn't normal? That seems ah. to be assuming a normal distribution of preferences. Yep, yep, yep. So if you have a non-normal distribution of preferences, uh, you can still show that it, it approaches uh, being optimal. No, you're completely right. So this goes to now the edge cases that you have to deal with the practical limitations where you have a radical that might be a minority with uh, a crazy amount of the voting power, and they might be able to sway a vote in a way that the majority wouldn't otherwise. The example that Glenn Will likes to use a lot was Prop 8 over in um, California. And the idea being that if it wasn't one person, one vote, then maybe gay marriage would have been legal a little bit sooner. Uh, whereas the majority uh, voted no initially, uh, there is a minority of the population that 
finds that outcome very pivotal. And if they would have received, and this kind of gets into the economics argument, if, they, if you receive more visibility uh, from this, you're willing to pay more. Uh, and in that sense, um, what we're optimizing here really is utility for the group. So there might be a case where you have uh, distribution uh, of what you think your, your utility curve might look like that um, aren't normal. And that is okay because it means that if you are uh, outside of the standard deviation in some extreme, you're still able to express your preference uh, and you'll express proportionally to the utility that you get from the vote. And that was the, the previous proof. Does everybody get why it's quadratic vote, not cubic voting? I missed why the marginal benefit of voting is 2 UP. Can you go back to the previous page? Uh, sure. Uh, what, was your, what was your question? Yeah, so his question was why it was 2 UP. Was that, was that the question? Yeah, so I guess it goes back to why the cardinal value is 2 yeah, why are the cardinal values to you? Uh, constants are nice, and uh, u is just uh, the, the, what the mean would be on f being what the most efficient thing would be. So this is just assuming that your utility is whatever it is, and it's ui because it, there's 10 people voting. The whole model of quadratic voting, the, the proof here is that if the cardinal value is 2i, you, 2ui, and really it could be uh, 2u, the constant value, we could kind of um, drop off. Uh, and the uh, so benefit of voting is therefore whatever your, the utility it is that you would gain from it uh, times the chance that it's pivotal. The cost of voting is v squared, as we defined. Then the marginal cost the voting is 2v, and if you set here, we can find the optimum. This is just like, you take the, you take this calculus, you just take the derivative of something, and you set it equal to zero, and you find the inflection points, the maximum. Does this also account for some percentage of people voting against their own best interest on purpose? Uh, yeah, so it's an optimal in different senses of uh, collusion that could happen. And so, for example, I'll just get forward because you guys are ahead of the test. So, in that case, in terms of collusion and fraud, um, what you talked about already was the worst case. A large number of colluding uh, people, the majority of people are colluding, and uh, almost impossible to catch. And then the uh, range of very large scale fraud. Uh, it becomes almost impossible uh, to know whether that is actually an honest vote or a dishonest vote. So 100% are um, limitations to uh, this mechanism, and then there are uh, facets in which it breaks down. Um, it's good, however, in the average case, a lot of the times, where uh, if there's an average number of colluders, um, they will probably waste their money. And in the case where the public knows there might be collusion, it can be purpose because the totality of the vote goes up. And in theory, um, in the case that there is a constant number of colluders, a large population, uh, it means that their votes uh, don't scale, so there can't be a small uh, cartel of individuals that uh, end up trying to take over um, the system. And um, this kind of falls out of a lot of the, uh, the economics analysis that Glenn Whale did. Uh, there are uh, several implementations that this immediately uh, applies to. Um, binary referendums, prioritizing tasks, um, multiple binary issues, resource allocation, and um, obviously in our case, it's repeated elections with persistent historical currency. And it's important to note again, all these ideas came before blockchain. Um, it's really a marvel that they translate over as, as beautifully as they, as they do. 
Questions about the driving voting? Um, so I, I noticed that while how he says his name has a patent on quadratic voting. Has he made any commitments about uh, licensing? Uh, Will, could you repeat that? I'm sorry. I noticed that there's a patent on quadratic voting, system and method for quadratic, near quadratic, and convex voting in various types of research and voting. Um, uh, and I think it's by the author of uh, Radical Markets. Um, oh, yeah, so is he saying um, if that there was a patent by Glenn on mm -hmm. one of the mechanisms of quadratic voting, and he's asking if there was, was licenses? Yeah, any commitment on, on, on licensing policies. Yes, are there any commitments on licensing policies? Uh, uh, having spoken to him, he's pretty keen to see this being a rule. Uh, uh, particular uh, patents on quadratic voting is it super relevant in the blockchain case. Uh, we'll talk about it, but there's a lot of distinctions between practice and the way that it comes out in theory. Um, if you have multi-candidate elections, uh, the way that you pick what's optimal is you can pick the number of voters that uh, have positive votes for each election. Um, the nuances to kind of go into uh, are that you can vote for or against the nominee, so it's possible to have someone that has negative votes. Um, and if you have nomination mechanisms, uh, for example, the way that you deal with it is you have to set a uh, voting threshold. So the first vote for any person to be nominated doesn't cost one vote, but there is uh, a minimum bar in terms of X and chain. It's uh, 1024 EXE for a total of 32 votes, and that's based off of the economic model because our token does have a uh, price fluctuates. So there are um, uh, a lot of considerations that you have to take into account uh, when you implement this in practice. Um, <clears throat> can anyone think of some of the pitfalls uh, to implementing this? And maybe some of you that are working on the decentralized uh, voting group can speak to it a little more than others. How do you have people vote? They'll have individual private votes that are aggregated publicly. Okay, that is a, that's a question. So, how do you ensure privacy uh, among voters? One, uh, and that who kind of tightly along with it. How do you ensure um, that the voters are making fake identities? Um, so, this is pretty prone uh, to uh, simple attacks. If it ends up being that uh, uh, no one is actually real, then we are end up not paying quadratic price for a vote, and they end up paying uh, whatever the split would be between multiple people for the same uh, number of votes. Um, the answer to that is twofold. Uh, number one, uh, Sunan. Uh, elections. Uh, so the address with which you vote uh, should be changed every time that you vote. In that, uh, I would say the most practical way to um, to get you know, the, the the privacy debate. Um, the way that we've kind of implemented it. You have. What was that? No, uh, yeah, you're good. Okay. The way that we practically implemented it uh, was that if you participated in our token sale, you pass KYC AML procedures and register an address with which to vote. Uh, you're free to then uh, have this on a KYC registry, which is a smart contract on our blockchain. Uh, this is linked to an ERC-731 contract for identity, and you can kind of switch around the keys that you use to vote. So you get um, pseudonymity in uh, the votes that you have. The distinction that we've made here, however, is that the nominees have to have their identity at stake. Uh, so if you want to run to uh, uh, become a master node on the network, 
uh, or be elected in any way, uh, people have to know publicly um, who you are and what the resources are that you're contributing to the ecosystem. Um, does that answer your question? So if, if I find out what someone's public key is, then I can know who they voted for. So did you? Yeah, that was, that was the question. Do you want me to repeat it? Yeah, I, it's hard to hear. Yeah, so, so um, James asked if someone knows the public key, then they know who they voted for? Is that, was that the question? Yeah, that's the question. Yeah, um, so the problem with periodic voting is not um, uh, realizing who it is after the fact, but really is realizing it is who it is voting before the fact. After you cast your vote, uh, you can publicly reveal it without really affecting the outcome of the election. You can cast one vote uh, for nominee in, in our system, so once you kind of lock that in, you can no longer change it. Um, again, these are very practical differences to uh, the way it'd be originally implemented. And again, you even if you knew your private key after you cast your, you, no one would be able to know your private key until after you cast your vote. And after you, you can't change it. So if you want to uh, redeem your privacy again, you switch around uh, your public keys that you want to use and you keep your pseudonymity. And if you don't, then uh, that's also fine. And that kind of falls into the uh, next case, uh, which is uh, what if you're participating in collusion? So if someone knows um, who you are and uh, can persuade you to vote a certain way, the question would be, are they able to check uh, whether or not you actually voted in the way that they paid you to vote? And this kind of circles around uh, a lot of the idea behind secret ballots. And uh, there is a really big debate um, in this portion, a double-edged sword, where if you have completely secret ballots, there is no way to check if collusion happened. Uh, but it's also more difficult uh, for it to happen. And if you don't have secret ballots, then it's easy for you to check whether um, a system looks like they're uh, are colluding for an election, but the users give up their privacy. There is a broader issue that a lot of people don't realize uh, in implementing a system like this at scale. Um, anyone want to take a stab uh, at it? I'd love to hear any, any of the stuff that you guys are stuck on when you're implementing it on your own. Um, cool, I guess I'll uh, go into it a little bit. So these kinds of systems uh, work okay if everyone is participating. Uh, so if you guys were to implement it, it would be club for some government decisions. And let's use this as the analogous smaller case. Um, you could very well do that, uh, and it would, you'd probably consider it to be fair if everybody was able to participate in the elections each time. Um, however, if um, the group got to a point where um, you make chapters in every country, in every state, and everyone um, isn't guaranteed to have, and this was brought up earlier, um, formalized um, uh, utility curves with which you prioritize your votes. Uh, efficiency um, in the entire process. And the way that you kind of solve this is uh, you have one of two ways. You can either implement uh, representative democracy uh, in which you have something like hierarchical quadratic voting and there are representatives that uh, elect, are part of maybe like the caucus or the electoral college that are themselves elected via quadratic voting uh, by the public. Uh, and these guys are the ones uh, whose decisions uh, are delegated to and uh, end up making the final votes that count, similar to our own elections. Uh, but there's via random sampling. Uh, so if you take a random sample of the population and uh, large enough uh, population, you end up with what is probably a more normalized 
utility curve um, for what people can prioritize, and uh, you gain back some of that efficiency. So that is an important context in terms of blockchain implementations in particular. Probably the trickiest portion of this is decentralized withdrawals. Um, we did quite a bit of work on uh, making sure that system was robust. And the idea here is if anybody, anybody developed applications um, that distribute money on Ethereum or um, the other blockchain, uh, there is a gas limit to the size of transactions that you can um, actually uh, process. And there's already been several examples, such as uh, uh, King of Ether, uh, where the number of participants grow to a certain size that the uh, implementation and the way that it's written exceeds the uh, maximum uh, gas cost accepted for a block. And uh, this means the contract ends up getting stuck. Um, well, another issue that you're running well, to uh, and the way that you end up needing to implement it is uh, uh, are you familiar with plasma? Yeah. But with okay. Hurricane so Ethan. Uh, yeah, so we have a we have a question. Yeah, go for it. What was the point you're trying to bring up with King of Ether? Uh, for the centralized withdrawals, if you want to pay out to uh, uh, all different individuals, you have to take into account what the gas price and gas cost for the transaction that you're making is so if you're looping through an array the quintessential example and the array is too large you simply will run out of and the transaction got stuck um, this is then in detail for uh, decentralized withdrawals in the sense that you can't have a function that a single person runs uh, to redistribute uh, everyone's money or to tally vote or to do anything like that you really have to do so in a decentralized way. For anyone that's been following the plasma development um, cycles, uh, this is a, a key issue that people are trying to control, which is how do you make people drop money um, from plasma contract uh, in a decentralized way. And that's kind of the model that we've adopted for XM chain when we uh, do withdrawals. So at any point in time, uh, you can be draw. Uh, whatever the repetition was for the election they participated in. And uh, this is important because otherwise, you end up being a centralized party that kind of uh, control the election contract. So we can't have, there's no feature in our consensus model and your consensus mechanism contract that is closed. Um, election cycle can only be run by exit chain. The idea here is that even if and anything else happens, the system will continue to function. Is that something you solve by limiting the number of people who can vote? Or did you find a way that would work on exit chain but not work on Ethereum for making uh, counting, tallying up votes scalable? Uh, so we borrowed a lot from the... Uh, what? The question was, did you find a way to make it Work that works only on Exochain, it would not work on Ethereum. Uh, no, we borrowed heavily from the private contracts uh, in order to make our own withdrawal and redistribution system. So, Exochain is based off of Forum, which is itself branched off of Ethereum. The idea is that you get private connections and smart contracts. Uh, you still code in Solidity, uh, it's on EVM based. Uh, Optimal system, so any contracts that run on Quorum or Exchange Chain, you can run on Ethereum as well. Yeah, we have another yeah. question. Yeah, go well, for it. Yeah, I would love to just add, dive in a little more to that Plasma stuff. Um, so, like, I've done some work on Plasma. Um, I'm curious, uh, like, what is the main chain and what is the Plasma chain in the, in the model that you use? So the question was, what is the main chain and what is the plasma chain in the model that you use? 
so we don't have a, a platform team that manages the elections. Uh, it's a smart contract that takes a lot of methodologies uh, used in Plasma for distributing uh, deposits in that case. And we've kind of used it to make the system that redistributes money and wealth uh, with democratic voting. Okay, so maybe, maybe a follow-up question. Um, what influenced your decision to choose Plasma there over something like, uh, like a zero-knowledge proof scheme that could succinctly prove computation? Well, okay, what, was, what was the question? Um, what was the motivation to use Plasma instead of something like a zero-knowledge proof that could succinctly prove computation? Uh, we're working on a zero knowledge proof uh, model now. Uh, we've been talking to the Zcash team. Really, zero knowledge proof not on Zcash are kind of difficult to They are working on different uh, consensus models. So, right now, if you're going to create a zero knowledge proof, it takes around 40 seconds to generate the uh, the witness, and uh, it is kind of a problem. They are working on it, and we hope well, the first work that we do is a zero knowledge proof implementation for quadratic voting. So that's an active area of research for you and me. There are more slides, but I'm happy to talk about what you guys uh, want to discuss. Uh, again, if it gets you closer to working implementation of any of these concepts, uh, we're happy to contribute anyway. Okay. Uh, if you want to talk about the other mechanisms, I'm happy to. If you want to stick to quadratic voting, uh, we can do that as well. This is part of a broader slide deck. Okay. I'll save my question for the end. Okay, then you can probably, probably continue then, and then we'll ask questions at the end. Cool. Uh, so quadratic voting is only one of the things that um, really are in the tool set of um, decentralizing these problems via markets. Um, the other big one that Manuel came up with is called COST. Uh, it stands for Common Ownership uh, Self-Assessed Pet. Um, and the idea here falls out of optimal redistributive taxation. Um, the idea being um, that this kind of social dividend ends up working kind of uh, the way an insurance does against the major risks in life. This is a very libertarian uh, view of this, so I'll, I'll have super disclaimers and all of this stuff. But uh, if the government could act as though they bought insurance against, for example, being born into the wrong, uh, uh, into like a less wealthy, prominent family, or into different circumstances that you really can't do anything about, uh, redistributive spending uh, achieves this. The idea is to maximize the expected utility behind uh, available ignorance. So again, the idea here, if um, uh, what your actions would be, or um, uh, an impartial outsider would make a policy. Uh, there are ways to prove that like this is an optimal way uh, uh, to maximize expected utility. And it um, has a kind of rough implications. The original thought here is again to do this with private property, including land, uh, planes, IP, um, anything else where the kind of pseudo goal is to run a street gradually over the course of about 14 years. Um, the contrapositive to this would be the idea of absolute private property, which have now and why, um, let's say that there, there can be, uh, if your family owns a piece of land, they can pass it down to you early. Well, 
Whereas in this cost common ownership self-assessed tax model, um, wanted to buy it off of you, it, it would implicitly have to be in the market. Uh, and this, uh, I mean, broadly applicable again. So even if we don't look at it from the perspective of uh, um, private property, these kinds of things come over to the blockchain world, where, for example, you have asset people treat in similar ways. You could uh, talk about exchange listings, you could talk about um, um, Ethereum uh, uh, name contract, contract name registries, you could uh, similar DNS records. Um, so this is kind of what XMChain is doing to form our own DNS system. And if you want to tie a certain byte string to a particular address so that people can uh, just reference that via a registry contract, you have to kind of pay to keep that spot. And it has a similar effect to um, quadratic voting in that um, you own, let's say, whatever this name is or the domain. Um, you declare what you think the value of it should be. Have to agree to sell it at that price if anyone asks you to. Uh, and additionally, you have to pay a tax uh, each year that you do not sell it if you want to continue to keep it. Um, the part where the redistribution comes in again is at the end of each um, uh, year. Then the common pool that was being collected by all these taxes are summed up uh, for the asset class and redistributed as a tax refund or a social dividend uh, to everyone that uh, participated. And the goal here again is decentralization of power and partial socialization of ownership. Or to quadratic voting, uh, but in its application to uh, private property or things that can be found in of private property in the blockchain world. Questions on that? So, like, Ethereum also has a similar problem where they, uh, as of like right now, when you put something on the blockchain, then it stays there in perpetuity. Do you know if they're planning on using a system like this? to charge people for uh, storage space? So as far as I'm aware, uh, they are not looking into this to do the, the I don't think that. So like the idea is that they're moving here on to, at least once we get sharding, uh, you have to pay in order to rent out the space that you're using on the blockchain. So that's what he kind of referring to. This would be, this would fit like a glove, you know, systems like that, where you could uh, kind of choose to pay the location or a certain amount of the storage uh, in a certain shard, and uh, could definitely be used to solve that problem as an economic model. So, great, great question. Would love to see it. The last part is probably the recent and most exciting one. Uh, it was developed jointly by both Vitalik and Glenn uh, Wild. Uh, they called it a periodic public good provision. And it's a way to determine uh, what uh, allocation of a fund is given to a particular you know, kind of resource or program uh, given uh, another kind of market scenario. Um, so uh, under the quadratic public good provision, uh, public good it is, let's say a marginal park or talk um, about, it was funded by each person chipping in voluntarily, uh, but instead of funding the total pile of contributions, if you consider the contributions to be C1 through CI on the public good, uh, the government looks at how much money each person in order to determine the actual level of public goods funding. And uh, in this case, contribution C don't have to be equal, which means that uh, let's say that uh, we this was a national park, uh, we could uh, each vote our own preference uh, for how much money should go towards uh, national for help. Um, and rather than everybody having to pay um, an equal amount of funding, you can pay something that you should pay. 
and the, the use of the signal to the government to decide how to choose what the level of the public F would actually be. And they essentially created this crazy simple formula that uh, they then stuck an entire paper to show that it's optimal. I have to make my work for it. I will give everybody links to check out all this stuff in more detail if you want. But it's actually pretty simple. The square of the sums of the roots of the contributions. And you could prove that this is a way for uh, provision um, in a quadratic way. So if you um, wanted to use this as a model of blockchain, can anyone think of an example where um, making funds that are distributed to uh, people for some incentive to improve our ecosystem would be good? Can anyone think of it? Sorry, what was the question? Uh, can anyone think of uh, sorry, the quadratic public good provision uh, would make sense within the context of blockchain? My minor fees? Has anybody done? Oh, what was that? Someone said minor fees. Uh, minor fees? Not minor fees, but that's an. Uh, it could be minor fees, actually. You could, you could do it as a way to decide how much miners should uh, earn, I guess, over the year. Uh, but in a way that um, is better handled by other mechanisms. Uh, but that's not normal. Uh, the simplest one that comes to mind is the idea of anybody who's ever participated in a bounty program. Uh, bounty programs are ways for for organizations to carry a certain amount of money and incentivize uh, developers to kind of contribute either code or other um, uh, check for vulnerabilities uh, to the ecosystem in exchange for uh, a certain amount of money. And this would be a pretty simple way to implement a smart contract um, that uh, funds uh, different bug bounties that communities would like to see in a way that is decentralized. So those are three examples um, of uh, quadratic voting um, uh, as implemented kind of in the X and chain. Uh, obviously we're pretty bought in uh, to the theories behind what Glenn Whale while uh, actually is uh, proposing and uh, um, the idea here is to make it simple. So we have a basic limitation for quadratic voting done. Um, we're going to be releasing the application for people to actually be able to vote and uh, open sourcing that as well. Um, keep an eye out on that and um, we're going to be using these other two models that uh, we just I just kind of went over with you guys for different portions of the ecosystem as well. So uh, quadratic voting is great. Um, the horizon space for things that can be accomplished uh, with the ideas behind liberal radicalism uh, is pretty broad. Uh, so I encourage you to look into the other mechanisms and um, decide what the best way to solve your problem uh, is. So don't just limit yourselves to quadratic voting. Uh, there's different mechanism designs that, um, while they weren't designed originally for blockchain application, fall out of the same uh, decentralized and distributed mindset. And that's the presentation. organization where they have a person who is sort of a benevolent dictator and 
like what we, the organization that developed the specifications for HTML, where they have a council who then elects one person who becomes the, who is in charge of uh, drafting the specification for the next version of HTML. So whether you have any thoughts on systems like that where you just you like one person to choose all the other um, I don't know, to vote on everything else that you might want to vote on. I see. Um, if I understand the question correctly, uh, do we have a version of periodic voting available? Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is a corporate governance system that uh, some companies are kind of looking to adopt and try to use. So we are developing ways to change their mechanism to form permission networks uh, that, that kind of work in the way that you're describing. So while our main net, uh, I want to be as decentralized as possible, uh, we will be kind of making uh, quadratic voting slash radical markets SDK. Fully, I get people to uh, to use that to make their own applications. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, my second question was, uh, I watched a presentation at a MIT Bitcoin Expo a couple of years ago by a guy named James D'Angelo, and he had a theory for how you can reduce income inequality in the United States um, called the cardboard box reform, um, where if you look at starting in the 1970s, um, which is also like where your graphs started, um, that's when you see the uh, like more, like a much greater increase in income inequality. Um, and he attributes it to the use of Sunshine laws in Congress, which made committee votes public, um, which in theory was supposed to allow like average people more access to their Congress uh, person, see how how they're voting. But in reality, if corporations uh, a disproportionate amount of access to their Congress members, um, and so in his idea, this problem could be solved by just returning co uh, committee votes in Congress to be public. I mean, sorry, to be private. Um, just like how voting for like a president <laughs> is private. Um, so I was wondering why why go for a decentralized solution instead of working to um, allow for votes to be private and or working towards creating an institution which people can trust to uh, accurately count votes and make sure that people's votes are private. Are you an econ major? That's an awesome question, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, the reason behind this is pretty easy. Uh, like, uh, the, the answer is, yeah, we, we definitely should be working towards these kind of models. Uh, but you start to see a paradigm shift between uh, a blockchain in the way that it's traditionally uh, thought of right now by people in uh, it being the most decentralized possible thing uh, uh, and the power that uh, everybody can use um, that is still public. When you start to close it off, you start to get different merger properties which are really nice. So you can still up that uh, Again, you, you, you put in this like close set of individuals and functions kind of like a government and you can really have the public trust but verify. Um, I am of the ideology that a system like that will emerge in the next couple of decades. Um, and, and yeah, I would love to see that back in Congress, both to give transparency and to the people in the House and Senate making decisions on, on our behalf. Um, making that transparent as well. Yeah, eventually you could get to a point where you could kind of hand back uh, some of the voting power to uh, the populace. And again, you have other concerns and other other issues that uh, do that, uh, uh, including changing what the actual political system currently looks like in a way that could be very disruptive and not welcomed by the corporations. 
Uh, but it's definitely, uh, I think, a path forward. Uh, the field of study that you're in, uh, I would I would suggest uh, uh, to please look into it more. Sure. Uh, so I would love to change the Ethereum consensus protocol to address the things that I discussed. It's uh, not very keen to take my consensus uh, mechanism design. I uh, need to talk to them in a way also. We'll see if any of these things kind of fall into that. The reason that the can meet the price is because worth anything, and then the vote doesn't matter. Uh, uh, so the way that we derived the economics was to pick whatever the token price back and market volatility, what the safety, um, uh, as a, a simple example, uh, um, the pool is estimated to have a thousand people voting, uh, in order for, uh, uh defeat that vote, you need to cast a thousand and a and uh, given the fluctuating price of the token, this sets the level for sweeping an election initially to around $100,000. So there are token at the uh, price that it is that we put it, and uh, it could be the uh, uh, um, consensus safety as well as quadratic voting meaningful. Um, yeah. So that's why it's not just a smart contract. And although I would love to see the business model be changed to something that has one of these concepts and an economic model that I think makes more sense. Uh, the actual consensus mechanism is like a POA, uh, POW hybrid. So you still have to take a work guarantees and you're going to people start to from uh, what the equilibrium is. So let's say that you're a miner, uh, you get elected into uh, master nodes that are casting uh, blocks. Uh, if you start raising your transaction fees uh, in response to the user at all, um, if you start to make it more expensive for of, uh, of whatever security threshold it is that uh, 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 to actually participate in consensus. And, and the idea here of this market strategy, we could kind of reel in both the transaction cost to uh, make them more constant, um, as well as crazy overhead uh, to actually run computations on distributed systems vis a vis blockchain. So, yeah. Any other questions? TLDR, yeah. Uh, Quadratic relation for your own group. Uh, but I, I would put that kind of like a, you can do like an internal or something where you're the club and people get to vote proportionally to the fund as they contribute. Um, so that'd be cool to, to see. Uh, suggestion. Wait, we, had a, we had a question. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, sorry, I have one more question. Um, so, you said that in order for people to vote, they need to be KYC'd on your network. But, like, are your tokens tradable on secondary markets? And what happens if people get their hands on your token without KYC? 
corrupted their votes just like not get counted by whatever system yeah. like counts the votes? And like you never really talked about what counts the votes or like how that process works. Cool. Uh, yeah, happy to uh, go into it a little bit more in depth. We are not officially listed on another exchanges on the secondary markets. Uh, I can't do anything about decentralized exchanges. I wish I could, um, but we are actively trying to not promote uh, uh, broadly uh, giving this to just anyone who play Gnelli. We are requiring KYC for uh, the token swap. So once we do that into the main network, uh, we'll have the initial voting. And uh, like we said before, or eventually the uh, set that will decide in elections um, will be selected via uh, random sampling. So we pick a set of wallets, uh, so to speak, that are gonna participate in the next uh, quadratic voting cycle. And if you uh, own one of those wallets, you could use it in order to, to vote. And if you wanted to do that, you'd have to pass KYC. So, so we've tried so, to make the system as practical as we can. Um, but yeah, there's definitely uh, the double-edged sword of if you uh, uh, verify that you're not doubling uh, your identity and committing fraud by having two voting accounts, uh, you won't be able to vote. So in order to vote on Exim Chain, people have to buy the tokens from you and then send it back to you and then buy them again? Um, what? You mean there will definitely be centralized markets for people to buy the token? We, we're not going to be doing that until uh, we switch everything over onto the mainnet. But no, we're not doing another token sale. Although, I guess technically, yeah, that's what we did. Uh, Right, I'm, I'm just confused. So, like, when people vote, they send their tokens. Is it a staking system, or are they send their tokens somewhere? They send it to a smart contract. So, where is that? Does that uh, burn them, or what is that? And where do they go? contract, and at the end of each cycle. Uh, it's redistributed between the people that voted. So you kind of get a withdrawal voucher for a certain number of tokens depending on the number of votes in that election and the number of people that participated. Uh, so the entire thing is decentralized. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, do we have, yeah, well we should probably also wrap up. You have to go home or anything? Yeah. Uh, let's keep the of questions. I have a hard stop in a few minutes. Okay, so we could probably have enough time for like one or two questions. As long yeah. as, yeah, yeah, go. So if you have, yeah. So if you have an issue with uh, centralized exchanges and you said there's nothing you can do about it, how do you think Tizo uh, would feel about the centralized blockchain? Wait, sorry, did you say decentralized or centralized? He said that he has issues. He can't do anything about centralized. No, exchanges. decentralized exchanges. That's what he said. He said centralized. No, I, I was I was hearing. He said these. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, never mind. Yeah, we're good. I don't know. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So thanks for for sharing your thoughts on quadratic voting, and we'll definitely keep you updated on where we are on the whole decentralized voting process. Um, awesome. Uh, let me know and uh, uh, again, anyone that's in decentralized voting group, uh, please let uh, Will know. Uh, you have my contact information, please give it out. Uh, if anyone's actually working on an implementation, you have any basic code that you've actually done, uh, please reach out to me. And if you haven't really implemented anything, uh, please do so before you reach out. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.